Okay, so yeah, welcome here to everyone. So tonight is already the last lecture of our spring series on the migration mobility nexus. So, so far, our speakers have addressed uh, three possible interplays between migration and mobility. It was enablement with, with uh, Jill Ahrens, continuum with uh, Angela Paparusso, hierarchy with uh, dialogue between Saskia Bonjour and Sarah Kunz. Sorry, I just mute. Uh, so, just check that everything, everyone is muted. So that we can communicate. Um, and uh, tonight, so Nicolas de Genova will address the opposition interplay by exploring the tactics of border enforcement in relation to the primacy of human mobility. So I have the great pleasure to welcome here Nicolas de Genova, who is a professor at the University of Houston. He's trained as an anthropologist, but Nicolas has crossed many disciplines including uh, sociology, geography, and political science to produce, uh, I think, very insightful research on migration and borders and the relationship between race and class, on citizenship and nationalism, or on the social production of space. And I have to say it is quite uh, staggering to, to look at his list of publications and also at the variety of topics that he has been able to address. So I will just say something personal because his work has been an important source of uh, inspiration for the projects in which I was hired to do my PhD, a project uh, conducted by Professor Christian Ackermann, who is here in the audience, on migration and security in Switzerland. And in particular, his book on the deportation regime, co-edited with uh, Natalie Poitz, has been a, a real eye-opener for me and also the rest of the team, I, th I think to highlight how the study of deportation can advance our understanding of state power and also the production of citizenship and alien age. Recently, he has conducted the collaborative research on the intersections of migration, racialization and border struggles in Europe, also in the context of what has been called the refugee or migration crisis. And tonight, I think he will draw on this research, but also on his uh, long-term work on bordering processes to explore the dialectic between human mobility and the tactics of border enforcement designed to govern it. So before giving him the floor, I would like to thank uh, Catherine Zontag, Flavia Kanjia, Petra Siedler and Louis Fuyemier, who have organized this event and had the great idea of inviting Nicolas de Genova. Nicolas will be speaking for about 45, 50 minutes. Then Janine Dahinden, professor of transnational studies here at the University of Neuchâtel and also project leader uh, at the NCCR on the move, will have about uh, 10 minutes, I'd say. Uh, to discuss his presentation and finally we will open the discussion to the audience on Webex and also on YouTube until 7.45. So Nicolas, your talk is entitled Migration and the Antinomies of Mobility and I very much look forward to listening to you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Robin. Um, for a very kind introduction. Um, and let me just say from the start that uh, for those who don't know, I, uh, you know, I'm very pleased to be joining you in, in Neuchâtel or in Switzerland more generally. Um, I had the good fortune to be invited to be a visiting professor in Switzerland and was located in Bern um, some time ago. Um, it's already starting to feel like maybe a long time ago. Uh, in 2009, I um, and so I have a, an enduring fondness for Switzerland, and and uh, I'm pleased to be in this virtual way, uh, returning home, one of my homes in any case. Um, so, uh, with no further ado, let me start. Um, border policing, border policing, and militarization, migrant detention, immigration enforcement and deportation are reaction formations of state power 
They involve the material and practical organization of tactics and techniques of control, but they arise always in response to a prior fact of human mobility. Rather than seeing these ever more devious and violent formations of state power, as if these were purely a matter of control, therefore, it is instructive to situate this economy of power in relation to the primacy, autonomy, and subjectivity of human mobility on a global scale, which is to say, on a transnational, intercontinental, cross-border, post-colonial scale. Uh, this primacy of autonomy and subjectivity is true, I contend, as much for refugees as for those who come to be derisively designated to be mere migrants. If we start from the human freedom of movement and recognize the various tactics of bordering as reaction formations, then the various tactics of border policing and forms of migration governance can be seen to introduce interruptions that temporarily immobilize and decelerate human cross-border mobilities with the aim of subjecting them to processes of surveillance and adjudication. Of course, these state tactics are also sometimes deployed to stop and reverse migratory movement, violent pushbacks at borders, deportations, and other types of expulsion, notably should be recognized as veritable forms of forced migration. Indeed, these coercive state measures that impel people across borders are arguably the purest examples of forced migration. This larger dialectic between human mobility and the forces arrayed to govern it reconstitutes these heterogeneous formations of mobility as something that comes to be apprehensible and classifiable, alternately as quote unquote migration or quote unquote asylum seeking or the forced migration of refugees in flight from persecution or violence, which is to say as one or another variety of target and object of government. In other words, the very distinctions that we customarily use to mark the difference between so-called migrants and so-called refugees or between migration and forced migration are themselves principally governmental contrivances that serve above all else to subdue and discipline human mobility into legible and manageable categories. There is therefore a permanent epistemic instability. I'll stop for the sirens if I pass in a moment. Um, there is therefore a permanent epistemic instability within the government of transnational human mobility, which itself relies upon the exercise of a power over classifying, naming, and partitioning migrants or refugees and the more general multiplication of subtle nuances and contradictions among the categories that regiment mobility. Indeed, such a proliferation arises as an inescapable effect of the multifarious reasons and entangled predicaments that motivate or compel people to move across state borders. Simply put, refugees never cease to also have aspirations. And against the dominant tendency to figure them as pure victims, and thus as the passive objects of the compassion or pity or protection of others, they remain subjects who make more or less calculated strategic and tactical choices about how to reconfigure their lives and advance their life projects despite the dispossession and dislocation of their refugee condition. And likewise, migrants are often in flight or fleeing from various social or political conditions that they have come to deem to be intolerable, thereby actively escaping or deserting forms of everyday deprivation, persecution, or structural violence that may be no less pernicious for the simple fact of their mundane character. In other words, many migrants may themselves feel absolutely compelled to undertake their journeys and are often inclined to understand their own mobility as veritable cases of forced migration, even as they nevertheless exude tremendously strategic subjective dispositions toward their own migratory projects. Hence the labels migrant and refugee commonly remain suspended in a state of tension and ambiguity and may only be sorted into neat and clean distinctions or separated by hermetically sealed partitions 
through more or less heavy-handed governmental interventions. Furthermore, it's imperative to, un imperative to underscore, once again, that the multiple formations of violence that comprise border regimes themselves increasingly convert the humble act of unauthorized border crossing into a life-threatening endurance test, thereby often contributing to desperate forms of flight and arguably producing refugees. Yet, even under the most restricted circumstances and under considerable constraint, these human mobilities exude a substantial degree of autonomous subjectivity, whereby migrants and refugees struggle to appropriate mobility and realize their migratory project. Thus, even against the considerable forces aligned to immobilize their movement or to subject them to the stringent and exclusionary rules and constrictions of asylum, the subjective autonomy of human mobility remains an incorrigible force. In my talk today, I'd like to consider some examples of how the government or management of the COVID-19 pandemic over the last year has manifested itself in various specific instances of the government or management of migration through state tactics of rebordering. By rebordering, I have in mind the variety of tactics and technologies deployed by states to revise or reconfigure how they produce borders and therefore also how they continue reproducing them, how they maintain and sustain borders, how they enforce borders and reinforce them. That is to say, I understand borders not to be fixed and objective realities, not inert things, but instead to be the effects of deliberate and purposeful activity. The products, in other words, of work. Hence, the efforts of states to manage or govern the COVID public health emergency have become substantially entangled with the ongoing work of producing and enforcing borders. And thus, on a global scale, the public health crisis has been converted into various spectacles of ostensible border crisis. Importantly, these recent border enforcement spectacles provide important instances where state tactics and techniques of control aimed at blocking and immobilizing migrant and refugee mobilities through detention and other forms of containment or entrapment always remain tentative and tenuous intermissions. Moreover, at times, such interruptions also become occasions for the coercive and commonly violent remobilization of those same formations of human mobility through diversionary tactics that reroute them or through deportation regimes that literally force migrants and refugees into renewed movement either by returning them to their points of origin, but increasingly dislocating them to altogether new and unforeseen destinations, however temporary. On a global scale, states have largely seized upon the public health crisis as a pretext and as an opportunity for implementing or intensifying draconian controls at their borders, resorting to a simple-minded logic of quote-unquote national quarantine to justify violent border closures and often vicious tactics of migrant and refugee immobilization more generally. According to the International Organization for Migration, the IOM, at least 174 countries had implemented travel bans, border closures, and other mobility restrictions to contain and mitigate the pandemic, totaling a minimum of 33,712 restrictions as of March 23rd of last year. With the rising panic around the COVID pandemic, therefore, the perceived problem, so-called problem of migration and illegalized migrant and refugee movements in particular, staged as spectacles of unauthorized border crossing, very predictably came to be reframed as a contagion of suspect, unruly, unwashed bodies, presumptive carriers of infectious diseases and vectors of an uncontrolled transmission of the ghoulish virus. The frequently racialized equation of border crossing so-called foreigners with the putative threat of contagion is nothing new, of course. Nonetheless, like the coronavirus itself, migrants and refugees have been depicted as a disruptive and dangerous menace that somehow intrudes from outside the presumptive self-contained space 
of each nation state and triggers a simplistic and often cruel logic of implausible insularity and self-isolation in the guise of public health precautions. Thus, the feckless bordering of the pandemic has served to unleash a pandemic of viral borders. Declaring a COVID public health emergency as its pretext, the United States under the Trump administration summarily suspended the consideration of virtually all asylum petitions at land borders. Relying on an obscure 1944 statute by which the government authorizes itself to block the entry or otherwise expel migrants or refugees purported to be public health threats, so-called, the director of uh, the director of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention issued an order barring the entry of asylum seekers and others arriving at the border without prior authorization to enter. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control has nevertheless admitted that closing the border does not effectively safeguard public health. This measure was coupled with the enforcement of a pushback provision introduced in 2019 that compelled asylum seekers awaiting hearings to quote unquote remain in Mexico, where they were stranded in overburdened reception facilities and hostels until their cases might eventually come up for review. With a treacherous Orwellian irony, this policy was officially named the Migrant Protection Protocols, even as it subjected asylum petitioners to due process violations, family separations, extortion, and kidnapping. Approximately 30,000 of these asylum seekers who were forced to remain in Mexico and were never able to attend their court hearings, furthermore, were deported in absentia. Such measures have not only made a travesty of the very pretense of upholding any of ostensible obligation to offer asylum, but also ensured that these asylum seekers now rebranded officially as deportees would suffer far more severe punitive repercussions if they were ever apprehended as so-called illegal migrants upon re-entry. Due to the pandemic, moreover, after March 18th of 2020, all asylum hearings were indefinitely suspended in the United States, leaving everyone stuck in Mexico in a condition of protracted waiting and torturous uncertainty with no relief in view. While commonly confined to overcrowded, unsanitary circumstances that directly exposed them to a radically heightened risk of COVID infection. As COVID-19 cases surged in June of 2020, U.S. migrant detention facilities had an average infection rate five times higher than that of prisons and 20 times higher than that of the general population. When migrant detainees staged organized protests against the U.S. Immigration and Detention Facilities Authority's man uh, mismanagement and cynical disregard of the risk of COVID infection, furthermore, they were repressed violently, including the use of chemical agents that induced res respiratory distress. Furthermore, even now, 15 months into the pandemic, there's no routine COVID testing for newly arrived migrants taken into custody in overcrowded detention camps at the U.S.-Mexico border. Simultaneously, the United States introduced the cynical contrivance whereby the same Central American countries from which most asylum seekers arriving at the U.S.-Mexico border had fled would be designated safe third countries for the purposes of deporting asylum seekers who had fled violence or persecution in neighboring Central American countries. Hence, the Guatemalans and Salvadorans would be dumped in Honduras. And Hondurans and Salvadorans could similarly be dumped in Guatemala and so forth. Thus, the United States imposed upon its junior partners in the region to accept and detain the asylum seekers who could not otherwise be refiled to the neighboring states from which they often claimed to be fleeing for their lives, but they would thereafter be deported and indefinitely imprisoned in other countries, labeled as safe third countries, but deemed unsafe by many of their own ostensible citizens. In other instances, the U.S. deported unaccompanied Central American miners to Mexico, callously abandoning them in a country where they had no familial or social ties and no prospective sources of material or legal support. Likewise, the United States accelerated the more general expulsion of any migrants or refugees already in, custody, already in custody, forcibly returning many 
who were later found to be COVID positive upon arrival in the countries to which they were deported. Thus, the accelerated U.S. detention, uh, the accelerated U.S. deportation regime itself came to operate very predictably as a devious vehicle for the reckless international transmission and proliferation of the virus. Of course, these long and circuitous detours are likely to eventually amount to extended and arduous forms by which migrants and refugees are trapped or contained within their own mobility and have their migratory itineraries significantly prolonged and diverted to altogether unforeseen destinations en route. Nonetheless, the probable cumulative effect for many will have been that their actual migrations are interrupted and decelerated, but not halted or reversed. In this respect, whole countries and indeed multi-country corridors of migratory transit are converted into de facto open air detention camps in the very crucial sense that they introduce interruptions that decelerate the momentum of migrant mobilities, but ultimately they commonly do not necessarily stop or reverse migration. This is especially visible when we consider the detention camps that have arisen as statist solutions, so-called, to migrant and refugee reception, where newly arriving migrant mobilities are slowed down for the purposes of registration, processing, and adjudication. And as much as these state-run camps decelerate the momentum of migratory movement, they resemble the self-organized migrant and refugee camps that have proliferated in border zones where migrants and refugees must wait to strategically plan their attempts to autonomously cross the next frontier as in such places as Calais, at the French entrance to the tunnel that crosses the English Channel, or Gurugu, the mountain in Morocco just outside of the Spanish enclave of Melilla, uh, which have been very long-standing self-organized migrant sites for staging border crossings, or more short-lived sites, such as the Edomeni camp at Greece's border with Macedonia during the height of Europe's so-called migrant crisis in 2015 or the camps in Serbia, where thousands gathered in the ensuing years in the hope of crossing into Hungary. But this process of deceleration is also evident in the de facto detention of newly arrived migrants and refugees in remote so-called reception centers, where asylum seekers may even be free to come and go and finally are free to leave altogether and disappear into migrant illegality, but are otherwise sequestered by receiving states in remote locales far from any practical means of recommencing their migratory projects. Frequently then, particularly under circumstances that do not culminate in outright deportations, detention in its various forms serves to interrupt migratory movement temporarily instead of halting it, operating in effect as decompression chambers. Hence, there are migrants and refugees who in one way or another get stranded or stuck, temporarily immobilized, en route. Whether they get blocked at border crossing sites or pushed back and contained in makeshift self-organized border zone camps or in shelters or hostels, operated by charities, humanitarian NGOs, or solidarity organizations, who must wait out the border regime, hoping to eventually prevail in their mobility projects. In such examples, it's crucial to see that these standby tactics of migrant and refugee autonomy and their counterpart in the detention facilities of various states' borders, border regimes uh, where migration is coercively stalled are indeed not so much simple examples of exclusion in any pure sense as they serve to modulate the terms and conditions of a kind of subordinate inclusion that is, first of all, instigated by the autonomy and sheer determination of the migrants themselves. And these forms of temporally prolonging the migratory process through tactics of interruption and deceleration seem to be similarly evident when states deport migrants to states other than their countries of origin, as in the recent efforts of the United States, but also as has been done for many years in the deportation from North African countries of African migrants and refugees aspiring to reach Europe to spaces of abandonment at the southern edge of the Sahara, particularly in Mali. Notably in the context of the deportation dragnets and mass expulsions 
of migrants enforced in response to the COVID pandemic, the equation of migrants with contagion has sometimes also characterized the reactions of so-called sending states against returning migrants or deportees, where they are similarly figured as invasive and unwelcome external vectors of disease and viral transmission, and thereby rebranded as unwelcome quote unquote migrants, even in their countries of origin and presumptive citizenship. Hence, during the pandemic, migrants have been increasingly challenged by a double process of rebordering by both sending and receiving states, driven by the false and ultimately futile logic of preemptive and punitive exclusion, commonly leaving the migrants trapped in a protracted and indefinite state of transit, all the while exposed to heightened risks of exposure and infection. From the standpoint of public health, of course, this is plainly a self-defeating strategy that merely multiplies the conditions of possibility for the virus to spread, but it underscores the extent to which a neo-Malthusian public health rationality mercilessly subjects some lives to a statist calculus whereby those human lives are deemed to be expendable and may be disregarded and discounted as affordable deaths. But for those who survive these travails, the renewal of their migrations frequently becomes all the more urgent and necessary as the only reasonable remedy to their failed migratory projects. From the US-Mexico border to Mexico's southern border and multiple borders across Central America, to the self-organized migrant camps at Calais, to the European Union's so-called hotspot reception and detention camps in Italy and Greece, to the so-called ghettos of dislocated deported migrants in sub-Saharan Africa, to Australia's island prison camps for asylum seekers on Manus and Nauru in the South Pacific, migrants and refugees' predicaments of being stalled, waiting, strategizing, and biding their time represent a whole spectrum of differing degrees of being on standby from coercive dislocation and confinement to more amorphous forms of containment, including, of course, being contained, so to speak, within their own unfinished mobility projects. And of course, for many during such periods of indefinite waiting and uncertainty, they are frequently, they are, they are frequently relegated to a condition of protracted unemployment and marginalization, even abject destitution. These circumstances are part then of a larger process of precaritization that systematically disciplines migrants and refugees into their ultimate socio-political condition of disposability as labor. Their eventual disposability as labor, however, must first be predicated on the material and practical enforcement of the disposability of their lives. This is amply evident in an exaggerated way in the context of the COVID pandemic, where overcrowding in unsanitary conditions directly multiplies the risk of infection and the potential for death. Through such mercenary exercises and putative prophylaxis, on the pretext of protecting the public health of their citizens, state tactics of rebordering in the face of the pandemic can be appropriately characterized as a verification of what Ashilimbembe has called the necropolitics of state sovereignty, for which the material destruction of human bodies and populations remains a central project. The often brutal tendencies of these border regimes have plainly exposed migrants and refugees to an inordinate risk of COVID infection as border closures have interdicted and confined migrants in overcrowded and unsanitary migrant detention prisons with no provision of adequate health care. The most infamous example of this predicament is, of course, the Moria detention camp on the Greek island of Lesbos, originally designated to have the capacity to house a maximum of 3,000 migrants and refugees, long foreseen to be the very predictable scene of an impending humanitarian catastrophe. The camp's population had at times swollen to more than 20,000. By September of last year, September of 2020, this notorious so-called reception center 
first created as an emergency so-called hotspot for the supposedly speedy registration of newly arriving asylum seekers in 2015, was estimated to contain a population of 13,000 people. As Europe's largest refugee camp, Moria was overwhelmingly populated by people who had fled dangerous conflict zones with a very large number of families with children, as well as hundreds of unaccompanied minors trapped indefinitely by the cynical stalemate of a European asylum system that would not process and resettle them elsewhere across the European Union in outrageously overcrowded and squalid conditions. And now in the midst of the uncontrolled pandemic, under circumstances that remain controversial and somewhat opaque, the Moria camp was burnt down on September 8th through 10th of last year in a series of arson fires. The fires quickly ignited portable gas canisters used for cooking and devastated the camp completely. The fires were variously attributed to either the desperation and exasperation of the migrant inmates of the camp protesting the severe medical lockdown restrictions imposed on them by camp authorities after the discovery of 35 positive COVID cases and the more general mismanagement of the pandemic, or alternately believed to be the wanton handiwork of local Greek fascists exploiting the situation, or not implausibly both reasons, both explanations. Virtually the entire resident population of migrants and refugees were violently blocked from entering the nearest village by armed bands of hostile Greek residents who also created roadblocks to impede the passage of emergency medical teams and even Greek military personnel seeking to reach the burned out disaster site to provide relief. Thus the newly homeless camp residents were summarily left abandoned to sleep and camp out on the remote rural roadsides. Meanwhile, even while Moria burned, Greek Coast Guards policing the maritime border were engaged in illegal pushbacks on the Aegean Sea, interdicting unseaworthy migrant boats and rafts and forcibly dragging them and abandoning them on the open sea in Turkish waters. The specifically necropolitical dimension of all bordering is abundantly manifest whenever migrants' lives are effectively deemed to be disposable, whereby migrants, particularly those who are illegalized and rejected refugees, are systematically and disproportionately relegated to conditions that enforce a greater likelihood of their premature deaths. However, this presumptive expendability of migrants' lives is inseparable from the larger configuration of forces that render them to be eminently disposable labor. Here, we must recall that Foucault's well-known proposition of the concept of biopolitics, which designates a modern form of power that responds to a general injunction to cultivate life, to make live, as he puts it, is always accompanied by the concomitant prerogative to let die. In this respect, it's always crucial to not apprehend the necropolitics of borders and migration regimes in a one-sided way as a purely exclusionary impulse, and instead to see the systemic production of border violence and death as intrinsic to the larger biopolitics of these regimes, which produce and regulate illegalized migrants' lives in order to ensure their subordinate inclusion. It is in this regard that we are repeatedly confronted with the apparent paradox that the very same illegalized migrants and rejected refugees castigated as so-called as an undesirable menace, once they've made their way across these violent and lethal border scapes, are also not infrequently later deemed to be essential workers, whose very disposability rend renders them indispensable to various well-established labor regimes that routinely satisfy the demands of capital accumulation. Even confronted with the ever more devious and deadly reaction formations of border policing and immigration enforcement by state powers, the constitutive force and autonomy of human mobility must nonetheless be central in our analyses of the veritable making and remaking of our contemporary world. Particularly under the restrictions imposed by states during the pandemic, 
it's abundantly evident that migratory projects and itineraries have been subjected to often violent reversals as a result of border closures, increasingly militarized border control, more heavy-handed detention regimes, and intensified deportation dragnets. Nonetheless, even under the most repressive circumstances and confronted with such cruel reversals, it remains vital to discern the autonomous force and subjectivity, the, the subjective versatility of migrants and refugees who continuously recalibrate their own strategies and tactics in the agonistic effort to realize their mobility projects. Even against the considerable forces aligned to immobilize their migratory projects, which may to greater or lesser extents compel them to revert to a kind of standby mode, migrants' subjective autonomy remains an incorrigible force. And waiting to be reactivated, their mobilities remain an intractable and always potentially disruptive constitutive power. The autonomy of migration is inherently and objectively political. Inasmuch as migrants and refugees can be understood to act in a manner that asserts the primacy of their human needs over and against the border, over and against the police, over and against the law, over and against the state. This is objectively the case, regardless of whatever ideas that any given migrant may have formulated consciously or articulated. Just think of thousands of refugees on the march across Europe in 2015, charging one border after another. Or think of the caravans of hundreds of Central Americans who arrived at the US-Mexico border in 2018, triumphantly scaling the border fence in a celebration of their defiance. With the idea of a politics of incorrigibility, I've sought to highlight not only the objective intractability of migrant subjectivity within the workings of border regimes that seek to manage or govern human mobility, but also in such moments of deliberate disaffection and defiance. I designate this as a politics of incorrigibility, moreover, because it confronts state power and its border immigration and asylum regimes with the impossibility of changing or correcting the abject excess that its own system of illegalization has generated and sustained. Proponents of the autonomy of migration perspective to which my own work has contributed have frequently advanced the proposition that migration can itself be understood to be a social movement in an objective sense. In the American context, the recurrent mass caravans of recent years composed of migrants and refugees, mainly Honduran and other Central American women, children, unaccompanied minors, and LGBT persons, signal an increasingly prominent example of such migrant autonomy and collective self-organization as a veritable social movement. These mobilizations have been a repeated and persistent occurrence over the last decade or more, organized more or less annually by the Transnational Migrant Solidarity Organization, Pueblo Sin Fronteras, the People Without Borders, often in the run-up to the Easter Sunday holiday to evoke the Via Crucis, the way of the cross associated with the biblical narrative of the passion of Jesus. The caravans provide a model of collective, organized migrant and refugee self-protection against the predations of their migratory journey, as well as an affirmative protest mobilization against unjust border and migration policies. It's crucial to note, however, that a very large portion of these are people fleeing violence in numerous forms, including state repression, as well as disasters associated with climate change, and they aspire to petition for asylum. This is precisely the sort of humble but nonetheless audacious refugee self-assertion and self-organization that I, with Glenda Carelli and Martina Tazzioli, have called the autonomy of asylum. In this perspective, the questions of asylum, including the stringent and exclusionary juridical provisions for refugee recognition and protection and the hegemonic narratives of victimization, persecution, and forced migration must be rendered apprehensible and commensurate with the irreducibility of refugees' constrained but nonetheless substantial autonomy, freedom of movement, and subjectivity, whereby asylum seekers petition for protection and at the same time refuse to accept the spatial traps and restrictions imposed by the asylum regime's so-called rules of the game. The mass caravans 
of asylum seekers whose collective mobilization defies the customary and obligatory narratives, constructing them as pure victims, repudiate and defy the hegemonic expectation that bona fide and legitimate refugees could only ever be the objects of someone else's pity, compassion, and protection, and instead affirm and boldly assert their subjectivity and autonomy. At the start of 2021, the first major caravan since the COVID outbreak was on the march, originating in the Honduran city of San Pedro Sula in the aftermath of the combined economic and social devastation of the pandemic, and then two back-to-back -back hurricanes, Eta and Iota, in November, but also as a more general repudiation of the violence, corruption, and impunity of the Honduran state, as well as societal violence and endemic poverty, it was perhaps the largest caravan to date, with estimates ranging from 7,000 to 9,000 participants. Upon crossing the border into Guatemala, the migrants and refugees were met with a militarized response that culminated on January 17th of this year in a fierce assault by state security forces wielding crude wooden truncheons hewn from tree branches and deploying tear gas. Citing the requirement that no one can be granted entry into the country without proof of a negative COVID test, the Guatemalan authorities justified their violent reaction on the basis of so-called national security, citing the risk of mass contagion and also criminalizing the caravan with the allegation that it was infiltrated by gang members. Then just over three, uh, just over, um, just over a month ago, on March 29th, um, closer to two months ago, I should say, um, the Guatemalan president renewed emergency measures when he again decreed a state uh, of prevention along the country's border with Honduras amid reports that a new migrant caravan might be forming in Honduras, a viral border indeed. If the pandemic has supplied the pretext for this convulsion of reactive and reactionary militarized border policing, however, the deeper infrastructure sustaining this extravagant and brutal response lies in the subcontracting of junior partner states, such as Mexico or Guatemala, to serve as de facto border guards in what is effectively an externalization of the United States border regime across the full extent of Mexico, Central America, and beyond. For at least two decades, the United States has persistently deployed its economic power and political force in order to exert pressure and inexorably enlist and command the compliance of other states across the Americas to marshal their border control, detention, and deportation capabilities toward the ends of intensifying the punitive repercussions for autonomous cross-border human mobility. During the same era, of course, the European Union has pursued an analogous strategy in its own extended so-called neighborhood of externalized bordering from Turkey and North Africa to deep into sub-Saharan Africa. In these ways, state powers in the so-called global north also conveniently outsource the most cruel violence of their border regimes to more overtly illiberal states that operate with fewer pretensions of humanitarianism and greater levels of impunity. This finally is a crucial dimension of the larger underlying dynamic that the COVID pandemic helps to elucidate. The frenzy of rebordering instigated in the face of the pandemic has served in fact to unleash a veritable pandemic of viral borders and in fact, an infectious and highly promiscuous contagion of border policing tactics that has spread with a viral velocity and ferocity. However, this viral spread of rebordering has not been occasioned by a random or sporadic sequence of haphazard interactions and exchanges, but rather by the steady, predictable, and largely systematic integration and consolidation of border regimes that exceed the limits and constraints of any single nation state's sovereignty or territorial jurisdiction. This, of course, is not to suggest that these border regimes are somehow not riddled with their own contradictions and conflicts, but it does nonetheless underscore their transnational, intercontinental geopolitical scope. And furthermore, their contradictions and conflicts operate in effect as a kind of convulsive harmonization on a larger scale. The differences that borders produce, furthermore, create the conditions of possibility for the violence, degradation, and racial subjugation of many migrants as effectively subhuman, 
And this is especially pronounced in contexts where migrants from the world's poorer, formerly colonized countries aspire to transgress the borders of the richest countries. Those richest countries, of course, are the imperial or formerly colonialist countries whose wealth, power, and prestige were accumulated on the basis of long histories of conquest, pillage, and exploitation, precisely in those countries from which an, inor an inordinate number of migrants come. In this respect, we can understand contemporary migration as a key site where the racialized post-coloniality of our global condition is realized and made manifest. And likewise, both the proliferation of borders on a planetary scale and the increasing consolidation of supranational border regimes, which encompass and integrate multiple state powers as well as various non-state contenders for sovereign power, emerge as complementary sites for staging the unfinished business and open-ended struggles of our global post-colonial condition. In all of this, however, the proliferation, fortification, and re-entrenchment of borders remains fundamentally a reaction formation, responding always to the primacy of the autonomy and subjective force of human mobility and the elementary exercise of our existential freedom of movement. And the transnational intercontinental geopolitical scope of these border regimes is indeed a kind of inverted reflection of the truly global character of these formations of human mobility themselves. That is what the caravans illustrate in a resplendent way. The autonomy of migration and refugee movements repeatedly presents itself as an obstreperous subjective force, and indeed a pronouncedly post-colonial reprise, enacting various configurations of human life in its active, productive relation to the space of the planet, and thereby reasserting the primacy of human life as a mobile constituent power in itself. The migrant politics of incorrigibility, then, is a radically open-ended politics, as in the mass migrant protest mobilizations of 2006 across the United States, such a politics of incorrigibility is well expressed in the chant, aquí estamos y no nos vamos, y si nos sacan nos regresamos. Here we are and we're not leaving. And if you throw us out, we'll come right back. In effect, migrants in such moments not only defy the system, but also confront it with its own irreconcilable contradictions and dysfunction. The millions who rallied and marched in those mobilizations were effectively saying not only here we are then, but also where do we go from here? By implication, the migrant politics of incorrigibility boldly articulates the contentious insistence that another world must be possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, yeah. Nicholas. Uh, I will immediately give the floor to Janine for a discussion. Well, thanks a lot, and particularly thanks a lot to to Nicolas for your for your talk. I mean, it's always extremely insightful and stimulating to to listen to you, and it's really a pleasure to be here. And it seems to me that I mean, you really describe, analyze, and theorize in your work all these extremely important and relevant issues. And uh, also issues that make make us thinking, I think, and this, of course, is a is something very nice. And I think it became it became a kind of a common saying that the pandemic works like a magnifying glass, a kind of existing disparities and inequalities become not only visible but they were reinforced locally, transnationally, and globally. And I would say that many scholars and often migration or border studies scholars, they started to work since the outbreak of the pandemic on, on this issue and showed really this kind of nationalist, culturalized, racialized, but also gendered policy or governance responses to the current pandemic. And <clears throat> in your talk, you put a light on a very particular aspect of this debate, so namely this uh, government of the COVID-19 pandemic and how it has manifested in specific instances of rebordering or how you frame it, how this public health crisis 
has been converted into various spectacles of border crisis. So you speak of a pandemic of, vir of viral borders, and I, I think this is a very, a very strong term actually to describe what is happening here. And then you argue also based on your former work that these border enforcement spectacles have actually the result that they block or immobilize migrants and refugee mobilities through detention, through these long transit corridors, etc., and that migrant mobilities are interrupted, but that they do not put those migrant mobilities out of force because migrant and refugees' aspiration to remobilize are always present, as you argue, as much as the subjective autonomy of human mobility remains a force and a political force, I think, as you also would argue. And I think this is all really very much thought provoking. And I just will pick out one or two issues where I would like to maybe ask you some questions. There are many other things, and I think the audience here is uh, will probably ask many other questions. So one of the most flagrant policy responses, I think, on the pandemic has been this consistent with an othering of the virus, no, in different regards. So othering in terms of a foreign a Chinese virus, but also othering in terms of producing the image of migrants as threats to public health, which is at stake in your in, in your calls. And of course, border controls and closures for migrants and people from foreign risk areas have been and still are extremely common. You gave very impressive numbers for this. And additionally, you bring up that uh, these rebordering practices basically put migrants or refugees under a health, health risk at the places where they are actually stuck in the moment, in organized camps, etc. And what I found really interesting is one small element which you demonstrated that we can find a, a kind of a, uh, upside down rebordering insofar as this so called sending state started also to refuse to take back the citizens as they also started to perceive them as a kind of health risk. So that's what you called in your, your talk this double process of rebordering. And I was asking myself if this double process of rebordering, so by both the sending states and so called receiving states, is actually a new phenomenon or if it's rather a phenomenon which became during the pandemic reconfigurated, reinforced, or also maybe filled up with new meaning in terms of health risk. Because basically, we know since a while that sending countries often do not want to take back the deported citizens, even if, if they are their citizens. Or to reformulate my question in a more general way, are these spectacles of ostensible border crisis during the pandemic so different from the ones we had before? Did the public health crisis simply add some specific spectacles or is it something new? I mean, you also brought up examples from before, but what is actually different? What did it add? And also in terms of consequences you described, in terms of the migrants being stuck, in terms of necropolis in terms of this subordinate inclusion? Is it this pandemic vital border? But how is it built upon things which existed before, basically? So this is, a, I would like to, to know a bit more about this aspect. And the second question I would like to raise concerns what seems to me to be kind of a particular tension. I'm not sure you will agree with me that this is a tension, <laughs> but on the one, maybe maybe it's actually a systemic tension. So on the one hand, we have these uh, violent rebordering processes and border spectacles due to the health crisis. And on the other hand, and you also talked about this, there is still and still was a demand for a labor force in the global north, also during the pandemic. And it seems to me that this tension is actually mediated through the function of filtering, which border regimes and bordering inevitably always have, a filtering which occurs always to particular criteria and categories. And it seems to me that this filtering became quite absurdly obvious during the pandemic, at least in the European context. Here we really observed and still observe that nation state actually 
they let enter those people as long as they serve for their own most economic benefit. I think this was quite shocking. It was really kind of a basic and blatant nationalist stance we could see particularly last spring, but which kind of continued to, to work in the European context. So this was an issue was very much uh, discussed in Europe or uh, in regard to agricultural and hospital workers. So I don't know if, for instance, you did uh, uh, follow this debate about whether to import Romanians and Bulgarians to Germany via special expensive flights to harvest asparagus for low wages, and this during closing more the closer times, basically. And on the other hand, like in Switzerland, business people and also scientists, we always could cross the borders. If we want to go to a conference for five days, there was this exception. So we never have been considered as a, or differently considered as a health risk. And uh, so that's what I mean by, by, this, by this filtering. And I really think it's a kind of intersectional complex, complexity when it comes to this filtering during the pandemic according to national, racialized, class, but also gendered and post-colonial and economic logics. So basically, you focus in your talk on migrants, particularly on forced migrants and, or what is called or, or produced as forced migration. But I think there are these border regimes and these border spectacles, they actually concern different categories of migrants. And they have been diff these different categories of migrants have been touched differently by these rebordering and border spectacles during the pandemic. And of course, I mean, I totally agree with you that these different categories of migrants are produced by migration governments, as you, you also clearly state in your talk. And so, in which way are refugees and asylum seekers, so forced migrants, touched in a particular way during this pandemic time when we compare it to, to other categories of migrants? And I think they are particularly touched. Also, it seems to me that some of the rights which are afforded to asylum seekers by the UN's HCR and the refugee system based on it, they came actually seriously on the tech in this time. For instance, I mean, some legal scholars there clearly postulate that denying entry to persons seeking protection is a violation of international law, also if it's taking place during the pandemic. So for me, the question is a kind of how do you theorize these different hierarchies of categories of migrants, which are produced through the governance in the context of the spectacle of the border crisis? And how do they enter also into your approach of autonomy of migration? And is the difference when it comes to forced migration, this post-colonial condition you describe, or are there other aspects? And also where is, is the nation state kind of in this kind of, of production of categories, but also violent border reframings and border spectacles. I will stop here because I really think other people have uh, also very nice and interesting questions, but I would uh, love to hear you just shortly about these two aspects I tried to raise and which I would be interested in. Yeah. I uh, thank you very much, uh, Janine, for um, your very thoughtful engagement with the, with the presentation and the paper. I um, also apologize that there's a lot of street noise today for some reason that uh, I hope it's not interfering too much. Um, there's, uh, I don't know what it is, some kind of loud motor outside my window at the moment. Um, but I basically agree with you that, um, you know, on the first point um, that that really um, what the COVID emergency presented was a kind of magnifying glass of the inequalities and hierarchies that were already in place. But in addition to being a kind of magnifying glass uh, that sort of showed how some of the existing inequalities and tensions and contradictions became magnified, um, I think it also was one of those occasions where on the premise of a, an emergency or a crisis that um, those same tendencies could be exaggerated and intensified by state powers. And so, so that's part of what I'm really trying to just, um, you know, walk through through a variety of examples that 
that it became, you know, you know, in the classic sense, um, a mobilization of crisis as as opportunity, um, in a way that then involved a series of tactics and techniques of rebordering that do indeed magnify what was already at stake, what was already happening, but also in a sense intensify and extend, and in that sense magnify um, these processes uh, in more severe ways and. Um, and, you know, so as you say, there are many ways in which all of the things that we're looking at were already true. Uh, at the same time, we also see something new, you know, which is uh, this intensification, this kind of refinement and, revi and revising of the, of the ways in which certain things become possible, right? Um, and, um, you know, and indeed the examples that you give are, you know, are fascinating ones about the ways in which um, you know, this spectacle of exclusion is always accompanied by, by its shadowy double of subordinate inclusion, particularly with respect to, you know, the forms of, the forms of labor, um, migrant labor that are deemed to be essential. And, uh, and I alluded to that briefly, um, you know, a different kind of example uh, in the United States was uh, the meatpacking industry, where the Trump administration literally issued an executive order. Uh, Trump himself issued an executive order saying that precisely at the moment that meatpacking factories were becoming hotspots of infection uh, because of the organization of the labor process, whereby workers on the assembly line, you know, on the on the the, the meatpacking lines are so densely, uh, you know. Um, organized in close proximity to one another, um, precisely at the moment that then those uh, those workplaces became the source of, uh, you know, incredible spikes and in community spread of the infection, uh, an executive order that insisted that those industries had to remain open because they were deemed to be essential, um, which is, you know, particularly uh, um, ironic for one such as myself, uh, being a vegan, um, that uh, the meat the meat industry was essential, but literally, uh, but literally, it was a mandate that people should be forced to work, uh, you know, and potentially work themselves to death or to work in, in conditions that could uh, that could potentially, um, you know, bring about bring death for their loved ones. Um, and and then to amplify that, uh, state governors in those states where the meatpacking industry were particularly strong, uh, you know, also threatened so that they would deny unemployment benefits to anybody who refused to go to work in that industry. So, so you see the very devious and cynical way in which the notion of what sorts of work are essential, um, you know, becomes a complete flagrant um, disregard for the risk for the people who do that, who do that labor. Um, and, and of course, we could multiply these examples. Um, transit transit workers in New York City started to say we're not essential we're sacrificial um, you know and and on the other hand as you as you say there is this way in which a, a double standard exists for those uh, for those people who were um, given license to move freely uh, because uh, because they serve a different kind of essential function for capital accumulation as businessmen or other sorts of professionals um, who are highly privileged. Of course, I mean, we could get into more detail about the subtleties of that kind of mobility in a European context where indeed, um, you know, some of that would not be considered to be migration at all. Um, but I think your point is still an important one, which is that, of course, my emphasis has been predominantly on, um, you know, on migrants who are uh, incorporated as working class labor, uh, oftentimes as very impoverished and marginalized working class labor versus those uh, those more privileged sorts of categories of migration, if we if we choose to characterize it in that way. And I and I certainly am inclined to do so in a US context, you know, to say indeed that is another category of migration. Um, but um, but but one which is privileged and you know and highly um, you know, and highly favored and facilitated. Um, but again, it, it magnifies in that sense, and this was your first point, it magnifies what are already existing hierarchies and inequalities built into 
the ways in which something that appears to be uh, about a crime predominantly about closure and exclusion at the border, in fact, is never that in any simple sense, that the, the same processes that I'm underscoring about a subordinate kind of inclusion also are about the, the mobilization of bordering tactics and technologies for the facilitation of the mobility of those who are whose mobility is select, uh, selected and privileged, um, you know, and, and advantaged in that way. Um, so again, the, the picture that I want to insist on is never one of pure exclusion and always to kind of come back to this kind of more dialectical complicity between necropolitics and biopolitics. Um, but indeed, the, the necropolitical assumes a greater prominence in the context of, of uh, you know, a public health crisis um, and, you know, and, and assumed, you know, in some of the examples that I shared, you know, a quite gruesome, brutal kind of form um, that I don't want to disregard, but I also want to insist has to always be embedded in this larger uh, framework for understanding um, these processes. So really, I agree with both of your points um, and, uh, you know, feel that they kind of amplify some of the things that I wanted to try to do here. But maybe we could open it up to the other questions and comments. Thank you very much. So don't hesitate to raise your virtual hand here on WebEx or also for the audience on YouTube. Don't be shy. You can ask your question to Nicolas or make comments. Yes, I see Christine. Go ahead with your question. Thank you very much. Hi, Christine. Talk and, you. Uh, um, I actually, th there's something I, I've been thinking about for a while when uh, you know, I, I read about you and, and also others are writing about this uh, autonomy of migration that I, I, I fully uh, agree with. And I think it's really very important to to point to that fact that is completely opposed to uh, much of the political vision of migrants. You know that very often considers, as you explained, migrants as being kind of uh, objects, or I sometimes use the image of parcels that can be moved from one place to another. And I think the the European um, Dublin system is a very good example of this that uh, considers asylum seekers as being yeah, mere objects of political um, decisions. And uh, they will just do what is being imposed on them, and that uh, um, disregards completely their own autonomy and subjectivity, as you explained. So I, I really absolutely uh, agree with, with that point, and also that that critique that you raise. But then I, I'm wondering how, how or yeah, maybe you you, you will tell me that's that's not the way that, that you think about it. But can we feed back that I that perception into? Political debates. Is it possible to kind of uh, reflect that back into political debates and uh, trying to give that uh, to change a bit that that vision of migrants without running the risk of even increasing the idea that migrants are per se threatening? Because if they become uh, agents of their autonomous agents of their own power with their own will. Aren't they in the eyes of these people uh, that that uh, are in favor of uh, restrictive politics even more threatening, and even more a uh, reason to close and uh, to to defend? Contrary to the idea, if if they are poor victims, at least uh, that here I, I again uh, I'm in the, in the field of asylum. But if they are poor people and victims and so on, at least uh, we protect them. They are not that uh, threatening. So I yeah I I would be interested in, in hearing you what what do you think about that? Thank you. Thanks for that, Christine. Um, no, I think it's a very interesting and important point. Obviously, um, you know the image that I showed of uh, of uh, people charging uh, the border of Macedonia from from Edomeni 
um, you know, is one that one could frame and read in very contradictory ways. Um, you know, for me, it's a joyous image and one that I that I am very fond of. Um, and uh, you know, and certainly um, could be framed in a way that uh, that ver that is, appears to verify a certain kind of bunker mentality, a siege mentality that uh, you know that migrants represent an invasion and um, you know and a threat, as you say. Um, so this indeed is the the crux of the problem. You know, um, you know, if migrants are recognized to be subjects which is to say, if migrants are recognized to be human beings, then they're threatening, <laughs> you know, um, from that point of view, from the point of view of that kind of normative and hegemonic um, discourse of, uh, of migration as some kind of, um, some kind of um, problem, right? Um, and this is, this is exactly where the, the construction of migrants, particularly asylum seekers, as victims may be more palatable and uh, easier politically um, because then indeed they're reduced to objects, not subjects, right? They're reduced to the objects of someone else's pity and compassion and protection. And, um, and, it, and it allows for a certain kind of self-congratulatory reinscription of, you know, the nobility of some kind of European um, project of humanitarian, um, you know, kind of uh, magnanimity and uh, generosity. Um, that indeed is part of the problem, right? That, um, you know, first, first of all, they're not fleeing some kind of conflict which is extraneous and external to Europe uh, when they're fleeing conflicts, you know, or the various kinds of things that, that are sources of refugee movements. They're actually fleeing predicaments that are largely the historical product and distillate a uh, crystallization of centuries of European colonial rule. Um, you know, as a, the world that we live in and, and that produces many of these uh, conditions that generate refugee movements is a world deeply shaped by the interference and intervention and and exploitation, uh, you know, of various projects of conquest and colonization. Um, in which Europe is central, right? So, so there is a way that now, as a as a reflex of European post-coloniality, um, you know, there is this constant desire to construct the movements of migrate of migration and refugee uh, flight as if they are somehow just things that have nothing to do with quote unquote us in in Europe, uh, or for that matter in the United States, as if they somehow are just the, the bad news of the world that happens to come crashing in on the door uh, you know, of Europe from outside and somehow um, you know and present Europe with some kind of uninvited problem to to deal with and um, you know so there's something deeply disingenuous and hypocritical and self-deluding about that about that construction in the first place which is about a kind of historical amnesia and disavowal of uh, of the real sort of responsibility historically of Europe uh, in you know in the in the organization of the world as we know it and the production historically of uh, you know and in the present day of uh, the conditions that produce these kinds of um, these kinds of you know dire circumstances right um, so the so so again there there is a kind of comfort and a kind of you know and indeed a cynical and duplicitous comfort that comes from the idea that. Uh, if people are purely victims and that they're being offered asylum in Europe, that it's because Europe represents some kind of implicitly superior um, civilization um, that is, has been able to secure for itself some kind of refuge of liberty and prosperity, and then in, in some, you know, je, je, you know, some sort of act of charity can, can somehow, you know, make room for a few people, but, you know, not too many. And, you know, and then, of course, there are the stringent exclusionary uh, considerations by which people are subjected to a permanent systemic suspicion and, ex you know, and, and various sorts of um, obstacles when they do apply for asylum. That ultimately means that most are disqualified, um, you know, and that's routinely the case. If you look you know, over many years, 
um, you know, the the overall acceptance rate for refugees has been quite low, um, you know, and it's an, it's an inherent and endemic feature of the asylum system that it's predicated on a suspicion that disqualifies and rejects the majority of people. Um, you know, so again, the first the first problem is a deeply vexed post coloniality of, uh, you know, of the asylum regime. And, um, you know, and yet, of course, politi in political you know, debates in mainstream contexts, you know, it's it's much easier to say, well, these are poor suffering victims uh, and that's all, you know, and, you know, and indeed many people are poor and many people are suffering and have suffered and have been victimized. None of that. I don't suggest that that's uh, to be denied, um, but, um, you know, but, you know, it's it's politically important to refuse that objectification of people that reduces people to the role of pure victim because then because then it reauthorizes and relegitimates the idea that uh, beggars can't be choosy you know they are put in the position of supplicant put in the position of beggars uh, and then you know they should be thankful for whatever they get and that's up to us those citizens of uh, rich countries who authorize themselves to, you know, to adjudicate the matter, um, you know, and so again, I mean, the the real point is that there is this this kind of um, inherent instability in the very use and mobilization of the category refugee versus migrant um, that plays those two things against each other. When when refugees or other asylum seekers are seen to be you know, uh, to have aspirations, they they look too much like migrants. And that makes them suspect, right? When they act like subjects, they become suspects. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then, you know, and on the other hand, um, you know, the migrants are welcome if they can be made use of, um, you know, so this comes back to the conversation about essential labor, right? Um, but all of that is predicated on the kind of nativism and nativism, a term that is much more commonly used in the US context than um, than in the European context, but a, a term that I think is more precise than xenophobia because na there's a nativism that is not fundamentally or first and foremost about hostility or fear of foreignness uh, as suggested by xenophobia. Um, nativism is the promotion of the priority of the so-called natives on no other grounds than that they are natives, right? And uh, so nativism is indeed, uh, you know, what I would think of as a kind of core identity politics of every nationalism. The idea is, you know, immigration policy should be about what is best for us, you know? So do we, do we accept them? Uh, because we think they're going to be useful. Will their labor serve us? Uh, will it be good for our economy? Um, or, you know, do we otherwise accept them because uh, we are making a choice that sort of, uh, you know, congratulates ourselves for our, for our humanity and our humanitarianism and our, you know, our, um, our capacity to accommodate people who, who, who need help. Um, so there, you know, so in either form, there is a kind of underwrite, you know, under underwriting nativism uh, that is premised on the idea that this is about, you know, us, the natives of the nation, protecting our thing and having a kind of entitlement and a prerogative to do what we will when people, you know, appear from outside. Again, the deeper the deeper dilemma is um, these processes you know, are about the falsehood of there being an inside and an outside, the falsehood of the self-referential narration of nationhood that then, you know, constantly needs the border to kind of, you know, reinforce itself and, and reinscribe itself. Um, so, you know, so the politics of that underscore the way that I'm approaching this, you know, challenge many of the fundamental premises and presuppositions of normative hegemonic politics. Um, nonetheless, you know, just to come back to the, the, the original question, you know, the simple matter is that, you know, uh, 
a politics that wants to reduce people to victims and can only accommodate them if they can be understood to be victims is one that is fundamentally dehumanizing, right? <laughs> you know, um, you know. So then there is this much more complex reality that um, that everyone is actively engaged in inhabiting life and pursuing their life projects and trying to make choices about realizing the, the prospect for a decent life. Um, so, you know, in that sense, there's an, an irreducible subjectivity at, at stake, um, even for people who come from the most horrific, desperate, nightmarish kinds of circumstances. Right? Um, and, you know, we don't do them any service by kind of reducing them merely to, you know, the sort of phantom, the phantom, uh, you know, kind mm -hmm. of uh, repercussion of, of some horrific event. Right? Thank you. I have another question by uh, Simon. Can you ask your question or make your comment? Yeah, you can activate your video. I will allow myself to mute some people. Don't be mad at me, just to avoid the echo. Okay, hey, um, and thanks a lot, Nicholas, for, for your talk. Really very, very interesting. Um, especially like um, hearing you talking about like the most recent um, topics. I guess I have a much more detailed, specific question on a conceptual level, perhaps, but also empirical, um, I very much liked your temporal rereading of um, of border control, um, especially because um, you went quite far in generalizing it, um, and and this really um, I, I found quite thought provoking. Um, but I just wondered if if border control is always only a response and a reaction, and I would fully agree with this. Isn't there also? Uh, politics of temporality in the, in the sense that also people on the move, migrants, refugees, use specific um, temporal tactics, strategies to evade um, border, border control or other, other forms of migrant government? And if so, I guess you would say yes, but if so, what would be your, your examples, maybe from, from the cases you have um, talked about? So if I understand correctly, um, that the well, I mean, I, I understand there to be two parts of the question. <laughs> one is the one is about the the proposition that it's always reactive um, and you know always a response, um, and the other is less clear to me. But um, maybe maybe you could. Maybe you can. Yeah, I can repeat. I was just wondering if there isn't also a politics of temporality in a way that. Um, we as scholars might also look more closely at in, in the sense that people on the move also use temporal tactics, like as you have said for, for um, border control, interruptions, degenerations, um, standby, and so on. I think isn't, well, I was wondering, isn't this also the case, or shouldn't we also look at temporal tactics um, on the side of the people on the move? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. And, and indeed, I mean, that's what I meant to suggest um, in a few instances when I used the term standby. Um, so there is a recent short piece that I published um, in a special issue of the online journal Ephemera, um, which is on the theme of standby. And so working with that idea, you know, and the, the term of course refers to an electronic device that, you know, appears to sort of go into a sleep mode turn itself off, but it's never really off, and it can be then reactivated instantaneously. Um, um, you know, I use that as a kind of analogy to think with, is to think about the, the ways that people on the move, migrants or refugees, um, indeed engage in a series of uh, tactics of, of standby, whereby their mobility projects can be reactivated as soon as the opportunity presents itself. And the specific example that I think with in that short piece is actually the, um, you know, the the very cynical opening of the border by Turkey last February, um, that then instigated, you know, various kinds of conflict between Turkey and Greece, um, but which really mobilized a whole variety of people, 
people who may have been working uh, in the informal economy in Turkey for years, people who had been effectively stuck in transit, uh, but whose my, whose mobility projects were never um, were never you know s surrendered or uh, negated uh, simply because they felt like they were stuck in transit, so to speak. Um, you know, and so you had the example of people selling off everything that they owned and leaving leaving their work and their homes in r rushing to the border because in this particularly cynical way, the Turkish state was actually facilitating uh, their mobility and 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 uh, and literally um, participating in various kinds of um, you know uh, various kinds of uh, efforts to break through the border. Um, and then, of course, it instigated a very, you know, sort of fierce uh, kind of fascistic reaction on the Greek side, including the armed mobilization of Greek citizens to carry out, you know, sort of effectively paramilitary assaults against migrants. But it also it also meant that um, Greek border guards were were engaged in outrageous kinds of abuses, um, including, you know, literally. Uh, stripping people of their clothing and marching them back in the in the cold freezing rain um you know naked um and deprived of their belongings um and beaten so you have you know you have this remarkable conflagration that happens uh, and it was literally just at the end of february and the beginning of march last year and at a moment before uh the full you know the four full descendants of the covid um of the covid kind of um you know, shutdowns and so on, um, but where, you know, but where, where, you know, state authorities on the Turkish side were literally transporting people to the border. They were literally intercepting private, privately owned buses, taking people off if they were deemed to be non-Turkish and therefore presumed to be migrants and putting them on separate buses and escorting them to what were basically closed border zones and where they were encamped uh, as uh, in, in a sense um, staging them for crossing the border uh, where sometimes Turkish soldiers or gendarmes were you know were literally participating in breaking down border fences you know I mean so you, so it's the other side of it's the other side of um, you know what we of of the kind of stereotype we have of you know of the border always as being about exclusion we actually see state authorities facilitating the mobility of, uh, of migrants and refugees in some instances because it's obviously serves their interests uh, they understand themselves to be you know getting some benefit by weaponizing migration in that way but we have many examples of that um and of course on neither side were either the Greek state or the Turkish state um, or the EU authorities, uh, you know, in any way, um, really acting in the interests of those people on the move, the migrants and refugees. Um, neither neither side were, you know, doing what they were doing in any way that was about uh, supporting um, their freedom of movement. But but nonetheless, there was a kind of way that openings were created, opportunities were created. Um, that people seized upon, right? So the migrants and refugees themselves, nonetheless, you know, saw this as an opportunity um, after a long period of having been, you know, more or less on standby, more or less waiting indefinitely, uncertain about, you know, when they might get the prospect to act. And then as soon as an opening presented itself, leaping into that um, opportunity. And again, that that comes back to your bigger question that there is a that there is a, a strategic way in which people inhabit the condition of waiting inhabit the condition of being stuck they're not only marking time but making time they're converting time into something productive um you know and that might mean you know in a in a kind of so-called transit condition that seems to be about paralysis and stalemate that they nonetheless are you know sort of um looking for the way to convert that into at least a temporary form of life, a, a way of making a living, a way of sort of uh, strategically figuring out how to proceed uh, with their migratory projects. So I think absolutely um, this question about temporality that I emphasized in the talk more on the side of, of state tactics is also very much at stake. Um,
in these various kinds of migrant and migratory tactics in um and then just to sort of quickly respond to you the first part of your question i mean is it always reactive is it always a response uh the bordering um tactics and technologies of state power this is not really a question i, I would there i just wanted to agree and i said if this the case and i fully agree then and then my question came so uh, maybe um yeah so this was not really a question sorry but again, obviously, well the simple the simple answer is just to say obviously it is a continuous dialectic and and then of course there are things that states do proactively um that then create as in, as in the example i just gave create new kinds of configurations of of what the border means from the point of view of the migrant you know um so it's not to say that states never do anything <laughs> it's only to say that what they do in a larger frame of analysis needs to always be understood to be a response to the prior fact that the human exercise of a freedom of movement is not something that is ever reducible to you know um you know to some sort of framework of law or rights uh you know or freedoms that are somehow sanctioned by a state but instead um are about our capacity you know are about our capacity um to make life our capacity thereby to make and transform society right and so it's about the relationship of the human species to the to the space of the planet and it's about the fact that that human mobility then presents um you know a variety of conjunctural you know situations and challenges for the planet to actually be spatially carved up into these discrete so-called national territories um you know that that the state project of bordering necessarily you know comes after um the a more elementary fact of human being um and the fact that human mobility is something that was always there first thank you very much uh we have i can take one last question if that's okay for you nicolas um because we are running a little bit late uh i will ask jenny to ask your question you have your hand raised. Yeah, Matteo, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no problem. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, we can, very good. So thank you very much. You basically answered to the question I wanted to raise at the end of your last answer, but uh, uh, perhaps just a clarification in order for me to understand. I come from a normative political philosophy, so I have the tendency to frame a little bit um, the elements in this way and uh, i totally share your diagnosis i mean i i think this makes really perfect sense to describe uh, what is going on and uh, to provide very interesting tools in order to make sense of it now what what i like a little bit is the let's say back, backdrop assumption and i wanted to ask is there a form of bordering that might respect uh, immigrants or uh, mobile people autonomy in your view? In the sense, uh, is uh, bordering an inherent moral problem, uh, would you say, that and therefore, politically speaking, we have to get rid of borders? And uh, in political philosophy, certainly there are some open border scholars uh, defending a kind of cosmopolitan perspective. Uh, everybody is basically a citizen of the world. Now the question is how to grant rights at this level, but this is more, uh, let's say, a political question. Or are there uh, borders that might function in your view in a decent way? Why I, I am asking this question? Because uh, I'm very much interested in the way you use uh, the concept of autonomy. And uh, I think uh, Christy uh, put the finger on a very interesting issue in the sense that if we consider mobile individuals as autonomous, and I totally agree that they are as human beings, 
at the same time, we start to put the problem of the exercise of their autonomy in relation to the exercise of the autonomy of others in a certain sense. And uh, it is at this level that some kind of moral problems can, can arise because uh, I don't buy their discourse, but we can imagine that some uh, anti-immigrants uh, uh, movements or uh, parties or whatever, they defend their uh, policies in order to defend the autonomy of their constituency. Now, we know that probably this is totally wrong in the sense this is not a real defense of autonomy. But at the same time, the question of how to deal with tensions when you have two discourses of autonomy that collides in a certain sense, would you say that would you stick to, I don't know, a Kantian view of autonomy saying that basically we are, uh, we have fundamental rights and we are, we should be our masters and uh, all the restrictions to that are uh, illegitimate by definition? Or would you go more in some kinds of relational autonomy in a certain sense in which autonomy is a kind of byproducts of the interaction of uh, significant subjects in a certain sense. And uh, if it would, this would be the case, are there forms of bordering in terms of dealing with these? Uh, I'm just using very broad category that in your view might do the work better than others in a certain sense or for you, uh, no, border is a restriction to human freedom, human freedom of movement, and therefore uh, the problem is the border in itself and therefore the state in itself. Uh, how, how do you see this? Thank you so much for that. That's a really uh, a big question. Um, that, uh, I don't have the answer. Huh? <laughs> I just ask the question. <laughs> it's a really big question to to address at the end when we have so few minutes left. Um, but I, no, I think it's a very important one, and it is very much part of what I'm trying to signal. Um, and uh, it's why it's why I finish by saying that a certain migrant politics of defiance, uh, of incorrigibility that says, here we are and we're not leaving. Um, you can try to get rid of us, but you'll never succeed. We'll come right back. Um, that spirit for me is also saying, as I suggested, so where do we go from here? So now what? And it's a radically open-ended imagination about the question of what's possible. Um, you know, it's an insistence implicitly that another world must be possible. Um, but it isn't, uh, it isn't attached to a programmatic uh, recipe uh, for what that, or a blueprint for what that um, new world is. So in that sense, I think it, it opens up the possibility of that kind of confrontation between competing claims or rival contentions, one autonomy versus another, so to speak, um, that you're alluding to. But I think that, it, but that the only way then to address that conflict or potential conflict um, is then to, you know, to really engage in an honest way with um, the complicities and complacencies that are at stake when people say, you know, for example, in, in a kind of anti-immigrant hostility, uh, this is our thing, you know, you're not welcome. Uh, we have to protect ourselves and our interests, you know. Again, I mean, um, uh, you know, we have to then examine how did how did the distribution of the world's wealth and uh, and all of its you know uh, all of its goods so to speak um, how did that come about you know how do we manage to arrive at a point where the immigration and asylum regimes of the richest countries in the world effectively uh, effectively condemn permanently the vast majority of humankind from any prospect of ever accessing, uh, you know, that uh, those repositories of wealth, which themselves are the product of hundreds of years of, uh, of modern capitalism, right? So, so again, I mean, the, what's ultimately at stake is opening up that big question about, you know, is another society possible and what, what could it be? 
but that's only possible to address on the on the basis of an honest reckoning with uh, what is the world that we've inherited, you know, what is the world that we're in, so that these kinds of miserly politics of, you know, well, we don't have room for these people, you know, we're already full, um, go away, you know, this kind of uh, this kind of disingenuous and and um, you know and uh, very mean spirited imagination is one that would have to be challenged. Um, but it's not reducible to, you know, your right versus my right, my autonomy versus your autonomy. I mean, Marx famously said between equal rights, force decides. Well, that's that's been true uh, for hundreds of years in a way that has, you know, condemned the vast majority of humanity to circumstances that are unviable. So then the question is, can we ask a question about the relationship, as I say, of the human species to the space of the planet that destabilizes and reevaluates all of those established hierarchies and inequalities that, that we've inherited and that we kind of more easily naturalize um, than, uh, you know, than the ways in which these things are ordinarily debated. Um, but, but to just answer your question more directly, is there a form of bordering that could be just, um, or is it the kind of open borders position? Um, well, I would say it's not an open borders position that I'm defending because open borders can be closed. It's a no borders position, <laughs> but indeed it is one that says that says that that is inherently suspicious of all forms of bordering um, because you know the minute that we examine this question about bordering, we're really asking a question about state power and territoriality, um, you know, and the normative nationalism and methodological nationalism that informs the ways in which we've been trained to think about the question of politics and the question um you know so our political imaginations are already in a kind of straitjacket and and you know and our normative and ethical imaginations also then become truncated and deformed by by the ways in which that nationalism is normative um, but that's, of course, the product of a history and actually a quite recent history in, you know, in the history of humankind, one that then naturalizes the state um, and, you know, and essentializes some notion of the nation, which it itself is a very transparent fabrication and invention of a, a, a quite recent history. Um, so the question is, can we be something else? Can we, can we, you know, imagine ourselves on different terms and can we conceive of the question of the state, um, you know, I mean, again, the, the, the question about borders really is a, is, a, is a vehicle toward a deeper question about the state. Um, and indeed, the, the, the question about the state on a global scale is inseparable also from, you know, from the modern condition that we inhabit, um, which is so inextricable from capitalism as such. So, um, you know, so in terms of a normative philosophy. <laughs> I think that there are all these big questions out there that are sort of behind this set of immediate uh, surface level questions and debates, um, but we don't ever come to a satisfactory resolution of any of these things if we don't then go precisely in the way that you suggest to those bigger questions. So I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for your detailed answers to, to this big question. And I'm happy that we could address this kind of uh, important question about bordering and uh, the, um, I mean, the justification for, for borders. Uh, I suggest that we end here this session. Uh, I would like to thank very much, to thank you very much, uh, Nicolas, for this fascinating talk. Thank you also to Janine for uh, her discussion her insightful comments, and I would like to end the session with a light tone because, Nicolas, you promised us to show us the, the little cow that you have bought in Switzerland. <laughs> and so <laughs> I would like I would sure. like to ask you My window to show this, this little red, cow. <laughs> the red figure above, above uh, me on the shelf, yeah. it's actually... Um, It's actually a, a Swiss cow, um, a souvenir from my time in Switzerland that was purchased for my child. It's a bank where you can save your money, uh, which is very appropriate also for Switzerland. Um, <laughs> very original. Yes. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Pleasure. Bye-bye.